Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Kimberly Phelan, a partner at Witham Smith & Brown. And today on HLB's International Tax Webinar Series, we will be discussing tax residency in the time of COVID. Our panelists today are Marielle, she is a tax advisor with HLB Vandal in the Netherlands. Jared, who's the Director of Global Mobility Services with Ide Bailey in Utah in the United States. And Carlos, who's the Director of Grupo Camacho in Costa Rica. I'd like to welcome them all and thank them for their participation today. Let's jump right in. We're gonna, first I'm gonna hand it off to the panelists and ask you what constitutes residency for an individual? Jared, do you wanna start with the US? Yeah, I sure will. So uh, the US is really kind of unique here uh, that we, the way that you determine residency in the US um, is, is really citizenship based and permanent residence uh, base. So the first two tests of residency in the U.S. is, are you a U.S. citizen? Um, if you are, you, no matter where you're living in the world or, or you are considered and taxed on your worldwide income, and in essence, like a, a resident is in most other countries. So uh, that that's the first test and the, the next uh, test that's out there is are you a um, are you a green card holder uh, of the US or a permanent resident uh, of the US and uh, if you are you, you also receive the same treatment it is that you're taxed on your worldwide income and as a resident if you fail both the first and second test then you go to the next test which is the substantial presence test and um, the the substantial presence test is is just that it's based on your physical presence in the U.S. and it's a it's it's kind of a it, well it is it's a look back test and so the way that it works is if the year you're trying to determine residency in the U.S. you if you are in the U.S. for uh, for any purpose at all uh, if you're in the U.S. for at least 31 days then you then look at this look back period and you start with the current year and you take 100% of your US days in the current year. And then you add one, uh, one third of your US days in the year preceding the current year or the year you're determining residency. And then you go back the year before that and you take one sixth of your days in the year before that. And if the sum of those three years add up to of that using that formula if they add up to 183 days or more then you would you've met the substantial presence test and you could be considered and most likely a resident of the u.s uh, under the u.s uh, or the irs tax code um, and so that those are the th that's how the u.s will will uh, consider their, their residency uh, for, for the most part, uh, th there are some treaty exceptions, different things, which I think we'll go over in just in, in a little bit, but uh, th that's how, how it's considered in the U.S. Great. Uh, Marielle, how about in the Netherlands? Can you give us a brief, brief discussion of how you determine residency in the Netherlands? Yeah, well, that's, uh, Kimberly, that's, that's based on facts and circumstances. So you look at whether you have a house there in the Netherlands or... Um, spend most of your time in the Netherlands and all of the, the facts like having a family, um, having, well, I said, uh, having a house, they're all weight and, and see whether that, uh, uh, that is sufficient to qualify as, um, as a resident of the Netherlands for, for in, individual tax purposes. That's, that's interesting. So it might be less of a strict days count like we have in the US, but more of a facts and circumstances. I know, um, for example, and we'll get into this in a second, that the United Kingdom has another strict days count as well. Uh, Carlos, what about in Costa Rica or Latin America as a whole? How did how do those countries look at residency? It varies from country to country in LATAM, but basically in Costa Rica, we have a 183 day count uh, despite of whether you have 
temporary absences, such as uh, vacations or business traveling. Therefore, the day count will uh, be critical for determining personal uh, residency status. It's important to, to uh, approach two issues here. One is that in Costa Rica and many other territories in Latam, the income tax is based upon the uh, local source income. Therefore, it's not a worldwide income tax that it makes a difference between the uh, importance of the uh, tax residency because any foreign earnings that are of foreign source are not imputable to the taxable base of individuals unless those are rendered from Costa Rica, for instance, or other territories that are based upon the territorial tax base. So it's important to determine not only the residency uh, test, but also the consequences that vary from those countries that have worldwide income tax in Latin versus those that are still under the territorial base uh, income tax. Great, Carlos, that's a great lead into our next two slides. So this slide uh, is a little bit detailed, but it reviews the different considerations that are used to determine individual tax residency. So um, can the three of you take us through this, especially for your country and maybe compare and contrast to other countries? Yeah, I, I'm so, sorry, Kimberly, did you say Jared? I didn't say Jared. I said it, all three of you. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry about Jared, that. Uh, I will, since I spoke up, I will definitely go through. Yeah. The, uh, as I mentioned before, you can kind of see here, um, the first two columns are like, this is a, a list of, I think, what is it, around 15 so or so countries that we kind of went through here um, and look at residency consideration what factors into residency in each of those countries it's really interesting that uh, those first two columns citizenship and permanent resident status most countries are no and like i mentioned in the first slide on what how you determine residency in the u.s the u.s does factor in citizenship and permanent resident the only one the only other country that kind of factors that in would be germany um and, uh, and and then if you what I and I let Marielle kind of talk about this, but you can this before. most of the other countries do factor in a physical presence, uh, but but you can kind of see that like in the Netherlands, you can kind of see where the all of the the home and abode and all these other facts and circumstances really do factor in in the Netherlands, unlike a lot of the other countries. So it's just really kind of interesting how this is, how each country is just so different. And I don't know if you guys have any other observations on that. Yeah, I, I see the same point, Jared. It's, um, and, and I know the concept from the Netherlands where you, where you really look at the facts and circumstances and are you working in the Netherlands, yes or no, and then all, the, all those factors are, are weight and in the end um, of course the treaty will give the solution in the tiebreaker whether or not the Netherlands may tax um, that income either based on residency or based on um, the working days or um, work performed in the Netherlands or having an enterprise in the Netherlands. Yes, I think one relevant issue for the discussion today is whether or not it's your intent or your uh, willingness to reside in a given jurisdiction, because that, that is going to be one of the arguments of this issue of COVID-19 that is going to perhaps even raise matters even towards courts regarding the dispute of whether or not I became all of the sudden spending 183 days in any given country that I was just there, not intended to live there or to set ties in that very jurisdiction, 
but all of a sudden it got stuck in the middle of a pandemic. So uh, that is a very relevant issue. And I think that the day count, which is uh, the physical presence test, uh, that is mostly the common denominator, it, it was intended to be treated according to scholars based upon the uh, willingness and the, the actual uh, intent of staying for a purpose in that very jurisdiction and not by accident. And I think that that, besides the treaty tiebreaker, is going to be another tiebreaker, but that very tiebreaker perhaps is going to end up in court. Yeah, I, I agree I with right. you, uh, Carlos. End yeah. up in court. <laughs> <laughs> so but before we jump into how uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic have changed, our approach to residency. Let's look at the next slide. Uh, sorry, wrong way. That talks about what is the impact of residency. So, if you if you have a client or you have a that ends up becoming a resident in another country, what are the issues they face? So, let's uh, turn this around and let's start with Marielle this time. What happens when you become a resident of the Netherlands? Well, if when you when you become a resident of the Netherlands, uh, or you are a resident. Yeah, when you are a tax resident of the Netherlands, that means that um, uh, you become uh, taxable on your worldwide income in the Netherlands um, for, for income tax, but also it will impact uh, the inheritance taxes, gift taxes, um, and um, it will also uh, give you certain deductions uh, like uh, mortgage interest uh, if you have your own house financed by a loan. And um, it will also give you other de deductions in your income tax return. And of course, it, it will give you um, access to tax treaties if, uh, if mm -hmm. necessary. I, I yeah, think that the access to treaties is, is a common denominator when you are a, a resident of a country. In fact, from the latest amendment to the tax treaties on the multilateral instrument, uh, we have that as a common denominator. You cannot claim tax uh, treaty benefits unless you are considered and deemed to be treated as a uh, tax resident of the country that is beneficiary of the double tax treaty. Yet. The other issue is whether you became all of the sudden a resident of that very uh, that very jurisdiction, as I was stating before, and that will not make you legible for the double tax treaty benefits. Therefore, if it's not going to make you eligible for that purpose, might not make you eligible for being taxed on a worldwide income base like if you are in the US or in Netherlands, or subject to uh, local tax for local source income in Costa Rica, provided that Costa Rica only tax the uh, territorial income tax. So that, that is where the factor of willingness is going to come into place. Mm -hmm. Great. And Jared, the U.S. Yeah. So from a U.S. perspective, the I've mentioned this a little bit before is that U.S. the biggest issue um, is that U.S. citizens or U.S. residents are taxed on worldwide income. So once you become a resident of the U.S., you have to report your your income from assets all over the world, and so. Uh, which is a really big deal, uh, can be a really big deal. Uh, the other impacts that it can have is, like this slide uh, demonstrates, is uh, there's additional taxes like uh, an estate and gift tax uh, that, that can be factored in. Um, the other thing that, like for citizens uh, and uh, green card holders, it's also unique to the U.S. is we're not a territorial system. We uh, tax our our, citizen, our citizens based on citizenship. And um, so if you try to leave the US, 
uh, you basically continue, like I mentioned earlier, you continue to be taxed in the US unless you try you officially relinquish your citizenship or your green card. And that's a, a big deal because if you, there's certain rules, but you could be subject to an exit tax if you try to uh, relinquish those, um, you know, your citizenship or green card. Uh, and that's a really big deal. The other, <clears throat> uh, the other thing I want to mention about U.S. is that um, we, when you become a resident, you tax. If you're married, you you have a choice, but uh, merit filing separately, or you can file jointly. And so that's another big uh, thing that's different to a lot of countries is filing a joint income return, income tax return with your spouse. And there's different tax rates that apply to that. Uh, there's also when you uh, become a resident, you're, you're eligible, you know, not only for the, the filing jointly, but you're also subject to different deductions, uh, exclusions, foreign earned income exclusions and foreign tax credits. Um, <clears throat> the last thing that I want to mention here that it's really a big deal is um, when you become a U.S. person, and I and the U.S. defines a U.S. person just like what we've discussed, a citizen, a green card holder, or a tax resident, you then have to report on informational returns your um, your internet your foreign assets. So the, the big one that most people hear about the United States is it's an acronym called FBAR, or Foreign Bank Account Reporting. So if you have foreign bank accounts exceed $10,000, you have to report those. It's not a tax. It's just a reporting obligation that you have to abide by if you meet residency. Why that's a big deal is because if you don't, if you fail to report them, which it can very well the case a lot of people that are new to the u.s that don't understand the rules or they don't have a tax practitioner that understands the rules they fall susceptible to these very draconian type penalties so for example a foreign bank account if you haven't filed a foreign bank account form there's a potential of a ten thousand dollar penalty per account per year for failure to file those that f-bar form which is a really big deal and then the U.S. determines that you're willful in your failure to file, then they can assess you even like increased civil penalties to the point where they'll wipe out your bank accounts and they can come after you with criminal penalties. And so it's really a big deal. And it's not just foreign bank accounts, it's ownership in foreign corporations or entities, it's ownership or being a beneficiary of foreign trusts. And so a lot of these foreign assets, you really got to be careful. Once you meet residency, that's a really big deal in the U.S. And there's ways around getting out of residency in the U.S., which we'll talk about in the U.S. If you do meet the substantial presence test, um, we'll talk about that with the treaty and different things. But but it really is. It's a big deal to get to be made a resident of the U.S. and 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 can be very complicated and very cumbersome. Right, and just for that international reporting that you just talked about, you maybe get out of get out of the income tax through a treaty, but if you are a resident and use the treaty, that is only for the income tax. That's not for these all of this foreign international reporting. So beware. So now that we've talked about what residency is and how you determine it and what the impact is, let's jump into what's happened in the past oh, six months with COVID-19 and how that has impacted our thinking on what determines residency. So Carlos, um, what happens when you have extent, you know, exceptional extensions of time that you might spend in a country during a pandemic? What issues are you facing and how do you address it? Okay, yeah. Uh, if we go by the rule in itself and we don't take into consideration the uh, willingness factor that I was uh, just mentioning, all of a sudden you become resident of that very jurisdiction. In most of Latin America uh, countries is the same. Therefore, there are in fact no exceptions in so far being a rule 
in order to create an exceptional state of uh, this pandemic situation. And there are many people that have become already residents of the uh, given country in Latin America, let's say in Costa Rica, and that will immediately make you a local taxpayer. If you were making no money in Costa Rica, for instance, which is a territorial based income tax, that is irrelevant because then you will remain as subject to taxation. Let's say if you are a US citizen, you will be remain as a US taxpayer because of what you are just explained. Well, this might enter into double tax matters as long as Costa Rica do not have a double tax treaty with the US, for instance. Therefore, if some uh, US citizen becomes resident all of the sudden in Costa Rica and is making money in Costa Rica, is not only subject to US tax, but to Costa Rican tax as well, based on income tax rules and not on non-resident tax rules, which is exactly the bridge between the residency and the non-residency for tax purposes. And we have to distinguish the fact of tax residency other than the immigration residency. It's nothing to do with the migratory status of the individual. It is all to do with size of economical mean, that is the number of day count plus the activity taking place in Costa Rica. In the rest of LATAM, when you deal with this, with countries that have worldwide income, this goes uh, back to the issue of double taxation for those that do not have or carry a current uh, double tax treaty while they're just stuck in the middle of pandemic situation. Great, and, and Jared, what, what has been the US response to residency issues during COVID-19? Uh, so the, the, the US allows a 60-day physical presence exemption. So um, again, it, it really doesn't matter if you're a citizen or, or a green card holder because uh, you're going to be taxed here regardless. But so from a, a substantial presence test uh, that I explained earlier, that, that three-year look-back test, in that current year, if, if your days in the U.S. started uh, between February 1st and April 1st, you can exclude a consecutive 60 up to 60 days in determining that substantial presence test. So, and the chair, it's um, how does this work? Because I think the travel um, travel ban is already longer than the sixty days. Yeah, the 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 U.S. will will only really kind of factor in those sixty days, uh, real under the the rep proc that the IRS has issued. So you're so if it's beyond the sixty days then really the only way that we could possibly get out of, of residency would be to probably rely upon a closer connection or a treaty position. Um, and, and so, but if you, yeah, if, if you've gone over and you still meet the substantial presence test and you were originally weren't intending to be a resident of the U.S., then um, the U.S. is under the IRS code is going to say really too bad, so sad. But then we might be able to allow for a, a different solution under the closer connection or treaty tiebreaker, which we'll talk about in a minute. Great. So let's let's jump in into the next uh, massive slide, a matrix that talks about what the impact of COVID-19 has. So we really have been focusing on the residency impact here in the first column by, by country. So Jared talked about the 90-day physical exception, but there are also some other reliefs that um, hopefully you can download this, this chart and presentation and see what exactly the impacts are. You know, it's there's a residency impact, but there are extensions of time. There's some COVID tax relief coming from different countries as well. 
Uh, Marielle, do you want to add in anything? I think this this cross border relief in the Netherlands is is pretty special, especially with the cross border that we'll get into in just a second. But anything before we move on? Um, no, well, the Netherlands it has, has indicated that, um, like uh, the issue that that Carlos brought up um, on uh, being um, on the willingness of being in a country and being there temporary, is that um, the Dutch government really follows the intention of the ind individual. So, if you're stuck in the Netherlands during your holidays or something, uh, that in principle will not mean that you become a tax resident of the Netherlands or a resident. So they're really looking at what is the intention of the individual. Um, and um, well, maybe maybe going to the, the this, uh, relief. Um, well, uh, the Netherlands has made um, um, tax agreements with Belgium and, and Germany uh, for cross-border um, workers. Um, where they say that if you need to work at home um, because of travel restrictions, um, the days that you would normally work, uh, say, in the Netherlands, but you work now in your home in Belgium, will still count as days worked in Belgium, in, in the Netherlands. So for um, Dutch tax purposes and for uh, social security regions, re uh, reasons, there will not be um, an impact uh, of of the travel restrictions. So I think that uh, yeah. they did that very well. Uh, only, yeah, and um, we, we have some. Thing... Yeah, we Sorry. have the slide on. We have the slides on that on, in, coming up very shortly. Okay. So go ahead. Um, yeah. Well, the, 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 shall I go into that, or, or do you? Let's like actually to, before to that we later? get to. The, Let's, before we get to that, let's just circle back on the treaty issues and how the treaties are applied, what happens with when you have non-voluntary residents and how the treaty positions work. So uh, maybe Jared, if you want to talk about the U.S. treaties and Carlos about uh, what's happening with uh, voluntary or non-voluntary residents issues again. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So really, the, the treaty issue is there. Um, uh, really for when you have a situation where you have two countries where um, where you establish residency and you're considered a resident in both countries. And, and that's why they call the, the treaty article, it's usually typically article four of the treaty, it, it's usually called the treaty tiebreaker. And um, in, the, in today's day and age with COVID, you can very easily see where, um, where people can be considered uh, re very easily residents of two different countries, uh, especially if you have two different countries that factor in physical presence. And um, so what the, the treaty says is that um, if you basically spent more than 183 days in a, in a country, um, where it, this is where kind of Marielle was talking about earlier about facts and circumstances and and the the treaty looks very heavily into your facts and circumstances where is the center your center of vital interest from an economic standpoint from um, your family from your domicile uh, it's going to look into a lot of those different varying factors to determine which country you are more closely tied to than the other. And which are under that treaty, that's what you fall, um, that, you know, that, that would be the country that you're a resident of uh, under that treaty tiebreaker. One thing you gotta be very careful of is when you, when you file a treaty-based return, um, a lot of times you still have to file a tax. So, um, another thing I'm going to talk about with the U.S. is treaty tiebreaker versus closer connection because this is really important and and Kimberly touched on it earlier about U.S. informational reporting. Um, under the U.S. code, um, there's actually what you call a, a closer connection, which is very facts and circumstance based as well, like the treaty. 
but it's only designed for people who've met the substantial presence test and are a resident, but they've spent less than 183 days in the current year. You can get out of residency in the United States using the closer connection. And what's nice about it is, is you can still avoid all that informational reporting in the US as, as Kimberly stated earlier. But if you've exceeded 183 days and you have to rely upon the tax tree to get out of that, um, then then you have your still subject to information reporting. Um, the other thing about the the closer connection is you can use that even if you're in a country that's not a treaty based country. You're in a country that doesn't have a treaty with the United States. So I I don't know. That's kind of the U.S. I don't know if um, Carlos or, or Marielle, if you guys have comments about the treaties and how applicable they are, but it, it, I guess in summary, they're, they're very facts and circumstances oriented. Yeah, yeah basically I after the, the multilateral instrument, uh, the amendment of the treaties that came along the lines of that um, uh, signature and deposit in the OECD of the multilateral instrument just make it a little bit easier to understand what the uh the links of a resident are while they might be apparent and when they become real and they might become apparent if they are deemed to just benefit from treaty therefore those are to be disregarded and I think that that very basic philosophy behind the multilateral instrument is going to be very, very instrumental for the discussions of non-voluntary residency issues. Because then, if that is true for claiming treaty benefits, that is also going to be true or shall be treated likewise for those conditions that become as non-voluntary residency issues because otherwise the the balance of the obligations and the benefits is going to be just uh, totally or uh, uh, break uh, out and uh, of course it can turn into double taxation uh with no claims even with the existence of the framework of a double tax treaty Therefore, the non-voluntary residency issues uh, were not in the scope of the OECD Model Tax Convention. And I guess it was totally unpredictable by any tax authority in the world. How can this happen ever? And now that we have uh, the ammunition of this experience of life i guess our tax authorities will have to go back and create the provisions for further uh conditions that might arise as a result of unforeseen events which might be either health war or any kind of other uh, circumstance that goes along the lines of the uh wording that the netherlands do use as the circumstances which circumstances is a very inclusive wording that shall be used with care but shall be used with the benefit for the taxpayer because the taxpayer is not willingly uh, uh, getting into that position just to avoid his tax position but he is just suffering a consequence of something that is completely out of his control Great. Um, one final issue before we jump into the corporate side uh, very quickly, because Maria covered um, this a little bit, is the wage and Social Security income issues. So uh, just to pick back up on that, Maria, if you could uh, talk about the cross-border workers and tell me when you want to go to the to the next slide that deals with uh, that further deals with this issue. Yeah, well, what we um, what is what is relevant and and here um, the Netherlands has, has entered only in agreements with Belgium and, and Germany because in the Netherlands there are a lot of workers um, working on the other side of the border um, and um, there they have, have agreed upon those uh, 
days that people are working from home where they would normally, according to their normal work schedule, work in uh, the other country. And this is typically what Carlos said, um, it's not voluntarily working from home, it's temporary um, working from home. And their um, agreements were reached with the two neighboring countries uh, that they would just follow for tax purposes and social security purposes the, um, the normal working schedule. And even if you're not working but still get paid, um, the taxation will follow the um, pre-COVID schedule, so to say. Um, well, currently those agreements are still um, renewed and still applied. And um, what I'm wondering is what will happen if this temporary working from home becomes the new normal? Um, will taxation of the income, well, of the um, working days in the other country then still be taxable in the other country or not? So that is um, something that, that only the future can tell us. And that's typically what, what Carlos says, well, uh, how will the tax authorities react on this? Um, Maria, I'm not sure may, I, may I ask you? May I ask you something? How do yeah. the other European countries have uh, react regarding these uh, bilateral agreements with Germany and Belgium, while the non-discrimination uh, principle of the European Union is in place? Well, the, the um, the, uh, the Netherlands have um, have reached this agreement, and um, in in Dutch Parliament, questions were asked. Well, how does it work against other countries? Um, we have clients working in from Spain, and they work two weeks a month in the Netherlands. Um, same for the UK um, and and for other countries. And and there, the Dutch Parliament says, well, we we haven't heard of any issues. Um, of people, of clients, so to say. So they haven't approached the other country to enter into a bilateral agreement. Um, and as long as this is all considered temporary, I, I, um, I'm not sure how the other countries will react. Uh, but this would be a thought of claiming that it's all within the European Union. and. Um, you could apply the non-discrimination clause. Uh, I agree with that. But so yes. far, tax and authorities the freedom haven't, of movement haven't reacted. And establishment. Sorry? Freedom of movement and establishment as well. Exactly, yeah. Um, so far, I, I think everybody in the European Union thinks this is all temporary and um, shouldn't become a problem. But well, you you only know in the co in the coming years, uh, with with hindsight, how how it will actually be uh, retreated also in the other country. Mm -hmm. um, Kimberly, maybe you could look at the next slides. Um, well, okay, maybe covering social security as well. There is also uh, uh, an agreement that the social security treatment shouldn't be impacted by um, by the the new working from home but as i said well what will happen in the in the in the future if people are working from home more regular than they did uh, before covid so i think i've covered that um, that part uh, kimberly great okay because now we want to get we want to get to the very next important issue, which is we spent a lot of time on the individual residency. We also have corporations and they can they establish residency in a different way and they may have some COVID issues as well. So Muriel, you want to start us through this? How do you apply substantial presence requirements with COVID-19? Yeah, well, in the, in the Netherlands, so the, the um, uh, residency of a Dutch company is in principle, if a company is incorporated in a Dutch law, it's a Dutch tax resident, unless based on facts and circumstances, uh, the company is, uh, can be considered uh, a resident of another country. 
Um, so, uh, and the fiction of law is, is one of the facts and circumstances. If you have like a Dutch holding company um, and you want to apply tax treaties, then um, both the Netherlands and the source country will uh, look at the substance of the, of the Dutch company where, um, and, and the Dutch, Dutch tax authorities have listed um, uh, all those substance, those requirements in the, in the law. Um, and one of those requirements is, uh, is, is the one that, that may, be, may cause uh, issues. And that's regarding the, the requirements to have the board decisions of a Dutch company taken in the Netherlands. If the board, if, if, if foreign board members uh, cannot travel due to COVID, um, it's, it's very difficult to take those board decisions indeed in the Netherlands. And um, there the, um, the Dutch uh, Ministry of Finance have indicated that they will look into that uh, very flexible and say, well, if a board member cannot travel due to the COVID uh, circumstances, they will not uh, disqualify, say, those, uh, the, the place where the decisions are made um, for, the, for the substance requirements. The um, problem is that under the, uh, the, uh, under some, some of the articles of associations of companies, they can simply not take decisions outside of the Netherlands. So there, um, from a legal perspective, uh, some action could be necessary, for instance, to change the Articles of Association to allow, um, uh, well, uh, say, uh, virtual meetings or meetings on paper. And that, uh, that, that could be necessary. But for, for the moment, the, the Dutch tech, the Dutch but the parliament says, well, we should still take this temporary um, um, circumstance, very flexible and uh, uh, not be too strict on the application of the, of the, the substance requirements. Uh, of course, it also depends on how will the source country look at, at that. Um, but well, that is uh, the position of the Dutch, the Dutch authorities in any case. Great. Carlos, how has Costa Rica been looking at corporate residency and the presence requirements in light of COVID-19? Yes, basically the new permanent establishment uh, regulations uh, have uh, triggered the uh, permanent establishment when there is a decision-making body that exists in Costa Rica that can perform and perfect uh, contracts by a zone. Therefore, these circumstances may or may not affect or be affected by COVID-19 because the effects of the contract are what is critical for us uh, Costa Rican territorial source income. Therefore, that, that might be the difference between the approach of worldwide income uh, uh, countries uh, compared to uh, territorial tax, because for us, what is critical on permanent establishment is whether or not that permanent establishment is running operations in Costa Rica, therefore is deemed to be treated as a taxpayer in Costa Rica for the source income applicable to Costa Rica, not the worldwide income. So it's a main a uh, factor of difference, not only in Costa Rica, but in many other jurisdictions in Latin America, where the uh, trigger of taxation is the source income on territorial base, other than worldwide income tax. Great. And um, interestingly, from a U.S. perspective, we tend to really look at um, the, the, obviously the facts and circumstances as well, but we don't have this mind and management issue that I know exists in the UK and Canada. If you have a, an entity here, um, you're going to be subject to tax here. We're not going to look at where that company is mined and managed to potentially move that offshore. Whereas, you know, a UK company that has a US sub that's managed from the UK might try to claim that that US sub 
is mined and managed from the UK and has UK presence, we just look at, no, it's a US entity, therefore it's subject to tax in the US. We have recently switched from a worldwide system of taxation, even for our corporations, to a territorial system. Uh, so that's still working its way through. Um, the backbone of all of this, obviously, is permanent establishment. So um, maybe you guys could take us through this. How, how does working, I know we've just started in it, but in the last few minutes we have here, uh, can you talk about what's temporary, what's at the location of the employer? Um, we've had this a lot on the individual side as well, where we have uh, executives from another country who are here running a US company, but were called back home, for example, to Germany, and now are basically stuck in Germany running a US company and how that has created taxable presence in Germany. So I'll, I'll turn this over to you guys and let you guys finish out with the permanent establishment issue. Yeah, I'll I'll jump in here just in that situation, Kimberly, where um, a lot of times we can factor in that 60 day exemption. Uh, if, if it's going to be residency for a key employee that's going to create a permanent establishment there, I w would I, I guess it would probably be in the U.S. if that were to ever happen. I think you can apply that 60 day exemption. Is there anything like that in it? Costa Rica or the Netherlands, uh, how can you avoid creating permanent establishment for an executive like that in Kimberly's example? I think I think there um, um, the the OCD had a had a nice example and an explanation saying that well um, if uh, if working from home of this executive is indeed um, a temporary and exceptional. Um, it, it will not form a, um, a permanent establishment in the home of the employee. Also, because the home of the employee um, is is not um, um, accessible for the for the enterprise. So it's it's the home of the employee, and it's not an um, an establishment of the enterprise at the home of the employee. Um, so the the um, in principle, it, it should not uh, form a permanent establishment. And where the yes. Netherlands have, have, have indicated that they follow this OECD approach, of course, it's, um, it's not clear whether the other countries will all follow the OECD approach and, um, well, not simply consider this home office as uh, a permanent establishment of the enterprise. But yes, well, indeed, least... and I think that that will be the case of other OECD members as well, because that uh, that is the case of Costa Rica, be just a new new member in the OECD, uh, following this explanation of uh, clarification of whether the home of the decision maker is deemed to be treated as the decision making place, or otherwise would these be under normal circumstances deemed to be the place of management and that that is the the breaking point that the OECD is making in this uh, letter basically uh, clarifying what is the the normal circumstance assuming that we would be in a normal circumstance would that be the place of management otherwise that would not be deemed to be treated as a permanent establishment Okay, we have just about reached our 50 minutes. Um, if there are any questions, could you please type them into the chat box? I'm sorry, I should have said that at the beginning. Um, and we can address those with our panelists. Um, this has been ever very interesting talking about residency. I'm sure it will continue to develop as this pandemic stretches on longer than we had imagined and uh, things will change for example the 60-day rule in the u.s i i don't know your thoughts jared but that was put in place at the end of march when we thought we would be home for two weeks to flatten the curve and and obviously we are still in a, a system of travel restrictions where u.s persons cannot travel to europe and and certain countries are still not allowed back into the u.s um what do you think jared do you think the irs and this is not a congressional thing that requires law. This is just an IRS policy. Do you think that will be changed well, the, at yeah, all? 
Yeah, because the that rev proc was just a uh, it was a policy. It was a rev proclamation that came out, like you said, right, kind of in the in the thick of things, the thick of COVID, and and um, as things kind of extend out and travel restrictions kind of continue, I do anticipate something. I I just don't know when. Um, I I would imagine before. Uh, the end of this year before tax season, we might hear we might hear something else where this gets extended. And otherwise, if we don't, we're going to be relying upon um, treaty positions and the closer connection position. But the problem, what's unfortunate with that is not all people are are from treaty countries. Or maybe this might extend somebody beyond the 183 days, so they can't so closer connection won't apply so it's really a tough situation and a lot of these for a lot of it can be for a lot of people and so i i do fully expect there to be something coming down the down the pipe but i i don't know when it, uh, things aren't moving very fast in the u.s government right now especially with an election year absolutely that that's going to throw a wrinkle or a, a curveball to everything yeah I'd like to just take a moment before we end to thank our panelists, Marielle, Jared, and Carlos. It's been wonderful working with you and having you on this panel today. Um, I know at least from our firm, we are looking at many more months of uh, this work from home. So I think it will become more important to pay attention to these as we start kind of reaching into the end of 2020 and into uh, the beginning of 2021. Uh, this webinar will be posted to the HLB website if you want to share it or uh, review it again. And again, if you have any questions, you can reach out to HLB Global or just email tax at hlb.global. And uh, our team here will be able to get your question to the appropriate panel or the appropriate person to get that question answered. Again, thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.